when you go in in 61, I mean, the U.S. has a very small number of advisors in Vietnam. Um, it's hardly in the news at all. By the time you get your commission in 65, of course, things in Vietnam are heating up considerably. How aware were you of this as you were going through ROTC? Um, President Diem is assassinated in late 63. The Tonkin Gulf uh, resolution of August 64. The Marines go into Da Nang in, in 65. How, how aware were you of this as it was going on? You're a student, so you have a lot going on, but were you aware that just really right at the time you're going to get your commission, you know, a hot war in Southeast Asia really is, is brewing? Well, I, I never thought about that question. I, as I look, as I look back on it, it strikes me that the main things that stand out to me from that era was the um, Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. and the fact that we came so close to nuclear war with Russia at that point. I remember sitting in the student lounge with my friends thinking at any minute the bomb's going to hit Milwaukee and we, we'll all be dead. Uh, that was much more powerful for me than Vietnam. I knew it was there, but it, it really wasn't, I wasn't conscious of that in, in a very in, informed way. Wow. So when did Vietnam then come into your consciousness in a very, a very real way? Uh, basically, when I arrived aboard my first ship, the USS Tossig, uh, DD, as the gunner, as the gunnery officer, but and I was in charge of the, the gun division. And uh, we were in shipyard at that point. And I was beginning to realize that the next thing was going to be happening. We were going to be deploying the Pacific because it was on the West Coast. And so wow. we were gearing up for war at that point. Mostly what the, the Navy was doing then was blockade and shore bombardment type duty. Mostly what we did when I was on the, my first ship, the, the Tossig, the DD-746, that was a that was a gunboat. I mean, that was a, a destroyer. It had uh, three dual five-inch cannons, mounts, and wow. torpedo tubes and all that sort of thing. So, uh, fundamentally, what we our job when we got there to Vietnam eventually was to provide shore bombardment support. If somebody inshore is having problems with attack, then we would uh, be firing the guns per their direction. They would tell us where to shoot and we'd shoot where we would come in to the shore, we would be within sight of the Vietnam coast, and we'd uh, cruise up and down in, in battle readiness for any time Marines or Army or whoever was in shore was being attacked, or they needed some uh, support, and then they could give us the coordinates of where we, they wanted us to, to shoot, and we'd shoot shells in or star shells so they could see at night. So we had... Uh, we had plenty of that kind of thing going on, particularly with the tossing, the first ship. Yeah. So that was, you know, had, we had six five-inch five, five inch guns and that sort of thing. And I was, I was in charge of those guns in the gunnery. And I would do the spotting or I would, uh, you know, give the commands to the, to the gun mounts and to get the commands from combat information center, that sort of thing. The most striking thing to me was, well, two things, the stories that I remember one that bothers me an awful lot is that we would we would be there day and night, cruising up and down. And the fishermen, that's how they made their living, the Vietnamese, would be all around us in these little junks. And we're a 350-foot you know, ship with, with big screws turning up the water. And we just had to follow the pattern that was laid out for us for patrol. And you just see these fishermen down there who we were supposed to be allies to and were defending. You know, shaking their fists at us because we're going through and tearing up their nets, their one major livelihood, all that sort of thing. Right. But that that was the kind of thing that just really kind of worked on you, especially when they did this. Oh. You, know, you bastard, you son of a bitch, you're, you're wiping us out. And then we would take during the day we'd bring junks alongside, and you know we got we're in general quarters, we got people armed on the deck and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, even at the time we were doing it, I said, what stupidity is this? Aren't these people smart enough to put a bomb inside one of these junks and commit suicide and just sink us? 
mm. every time they ever did. Mm. But nobody ever thought about it. Nobody ever talked about it. So I, I don't know if we were really prepared at all for that for that war. Was the purpose of um, stopping the junks, and I assume somebody's boarding the, the junks in and, and then searching them for Viet Cong contraband and that sort of stuff? Yeah, the idea was to blockade that, which was bringing in weapons to the South Vietnamese right. via the shore. Yeah. And so we would, and we would also serve as swift boats who went in up and down. Some, sometimes our officers would go on board to relieve one of their officers for patrols and things like that. So the swift boats were, were inshore, and sometimes we'd support them with gunfire. So it was, wow. a, it was a combat position, although nobody ever shot at us and nobody ever blew us up. Right. But that was right. what we did. And we would sometimes, the ship, we had you know, five inch guns, and they put out shells about, you know, maybe three feet long. Yeah. And they pop out of it. And we had our decks just covered with, uh, with these shells. We'd fire hundreds at a time. You know? Over a over a period of a, of a wow. engagement. So back to what you're saying about the net. So you're describing these uh, Vietnamese fishermen who have their nets out. They're fishing, and now your ship has been given a specific path, basically that it needs to follow. And so, following orders, you follow this path. And if that means the destruction of these Vietnamese fishermen's nets, then that's what that means, right? And exactly. But but it doesn't. They're not saying you should do this. What they're saying is this is the patrol path you should take. And clearly, you know the reason you're up on the bridge is that if you're heading toward the junk, you're going to turn to avoid them. Right. But you don't turn so far away that your nets are all behind them. Right. You, know, usually you could be far enough. You probably wouldn't do any damage. But when they start doing this, you realize that you you've done something or you're about to. Again, this was not a huge thing. It didn't happen all the time. Right. But it just, we never knew what we were shooting at. We never knew sometimes why we were even there other than the invasion. And all we were doing was doing our job and doing our duty. Um, but it was kind of hard to sleep after you stood a watch after after doing these things. I think we're really helping these these folks, you know? Well, that's, yeah. So that gets to the question that I that I have. So this is upsetting, and there's the human element because these folks are, you know, you can gather, you can assume, are poorer than you are. And if their net has just been destroyed, now they're in even a tougher position than they were before. So there's that sort of human thing. Um, the, you know, and, and I suppose that our screws scared away the, the fish, too. Yeah. So we, you know, so... We've just made these people's lives harder, and we're following orders. But, um, but was was part of it also? I mean, did you have the feeling at the time? I wonder if that Vietnamese fisherman now, who's shaking his fist at us, maybe he wasn't sympathetic to the VC yesterday, but maybe he is now. I mean, did did that ever go through your mind that you know maybe some of this is counterproductive? That by doing things that anger the locals, are we effectively assisting the VC, the Viet Cong, um, by pushing people to want to help them? Does, does, did that ever go through your mind at all? Uh, constantly, because we would talk about it in the wardroom when we were eating, you know, or just sitting around shooting, shooting the breeze. Wow. I think every one of us was sensitive to that. We sure didn't want to do that. We, we certainly had nothing against these folks. We were following orders. We could understand why they wanted to do this blockade. And, and you know, if you look at the history, they never were able to smuggle arms in, according to the records, into shore, the Viet Cong. They never were, according to the... So we must have done something right. But, yeah. uh, but it still goes back to that same thing. We knew exactly what we were doing. We, we knew that, that we're not exactly endearing ourselves to the Vietnamese people. I don't even know when we fired our our guns. We couldn't see the result because it was over the horizon for us. But uh, you know, there was battles going on there. We were landing probably on villages. Lord knows, for anybody in in that conflict, and I'm sure you've talked to people who are a lot closer than I was. That you know, the confliction, the conflicting emotions that must have hit people. You know, fear and anger and 
hatred and love, and embarrassment, and all the things that go along with not quite doing something that's straight and clean. Wow. I imagine the same thing is true of, you know, stopping the people in their junks. Um, on the one hand, you're getting on these boats to make sure the Viet Cong aren't, you know, that there's not contraband, there's not Viet Cong contraband. Um, at the same time, though, you know, people are trying to carry on with their lives and they're getting agitated and wondering, why are you here? And it's sort of the, the same thing. I imagine there were some people that thought that it was a good thing that we were doing that. I don't know. We didn't talk to them. We did have visits by people from the South Vietnamese military who were with the Swift Boat people, for example, who had come to alongside. And they were friendly and they were, you know, respectful and, and all that. But they were military and they probably had a different perspective. I'm not saying that this whole thing was evil or no. badly motivated. No. It just it was so conflicted with uh, counter counter purposes and things. It was it was hard, especially for a young person who hadn't really been in combat, to figure out well what's what's my real role here. You know? Well, you might be able to identify with this. Uh, I've said to students in the past that the more I learn about the Vietnam War, <clears throat> the more vets I talk to the easier the Vietnam War is to describe and the harder it is to understand. Uh, Cause there's so much about it. That's just, that's just kind of, as you, you obviously use your word conflicted. I want to ask you about the, the fire support missions. Um, there's the idea of, you know, the things, the things veterans carry, you know, the things they carry during the war, the things they carry after the war and they carry memories after the war. Of course, a lot of veterans, the memories they carry have to do with things that they know happened. They saw it happen in a con in a in a firefight. They saw it happen when the Claymore mine goes off. They saw that. In your case, you the fire missions come in. The order goes. The the um, missiles, if that's the right word, uh, leave the U.S. Shells. I'm sorry. The shells. The shells, right? Go from the USS Taussig. And you and a minute ago you said, and we don't really know what they hit. For you, is that one of the things that you carry as an as a Navy officer veteran of the war? That unlike the guy in the field who has memories, very clear memories, because he knows what happened and he can live it again in his mind. In your case, you don't know. The order went, the shells went, and you really don't know. I guess in a lot of cases, you don't know specifically what happened. Is that is that one of the things, I'm not assuming that you this is something that you carry with you, but is that something that you carry with you? Just that sense of, gosh, I wonder, I wonder what happened when those shells hit. In our case, we just did that, and uh, you just, you tried to imagine what was going on, but we never got post-action reports. They never sent anything back saying, well, you hit this and that. So we just did what we wanted to do. The only one time that something happened that was actually positive was I got a call in the middle of the night saying we're rushing in to do a, a mission support thing. And there's a bunch of Marines that are surrounded and they need star shells to illuminate so they can see where they're shooting. And I'm, I'm on the phone, I'm saying, what, what, star shell? Uh, do we have star shells, Chief? I talked to my chief gunner mate. He said, yeah, we've got them in the army. We've never fired one. We don't even know, I don't know how they work. He doesn't know how they work. And so I said, well, all right, get, let's go. I'm gonna get up. I went and got my gunnery books out and I looked and found this five inch star shell, how they work, what you need to do. And then I got together, we were steaming in to save these guys. And we wow. went in and we got the star shells to the guns and we fired them and illuminated. And we got this good news back that you know, that scared the enemy away. It was perfect. We were right on target and, and the way they wow. went. That was about the only mission that had any kind of real feedback. And I think we were all really proud of ourselves. And what the hell? We came out of total ignorance. Wow. And were able to shoot and maybe save lives and prevent some, uh, some killing. But that was really the only time. Otherwise, it was all just anonymous. Nine from the Navy. I, I owed them four years as a regular officer. I found out that they could keep me in for life if they wanted to. I didn't realize that when I signed the paper. Yeah. So at, at my resignation, they told me we can't. We need gunnery officers. And so we have to keep you in while the war, the war is going on. 
And I prepared a letter to them. I said, well, okay, I know you got me, but you know, I think you're damn bored. You're just stupid. And, and you're just, you're not accomplishing anything. And I, 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 I'm, if you're going to send me into combat duty, I said, I'm going to refuse. I don't think it's more. Really? It's stupid. I don't know why I did it. I was a young man. Yeah. My commanding officer at the time called me up to his stateroom and said, Don, what the hell are you doing? I said, I, I got to say something. Captain, I, I just can't do this anymore. And wow. he tried to talk me out of it, sent it in. They kept me in for the extra year, but they didn't give me any combat role. They made me officer in charge of Fort Island at Pearl Harbor. So how would you describe that then? You know, it sounds like what you're saying is you turned against the war. Um, was it that you thought that the war itself was pointless, that the way the war was being pro that maybe the cause was okay, but the way it was being prosecuted. What was it that 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 made you really do something that's pretty risky to write a letter like that as a as a young officer? Yeah, it was it was plain stupid actually. They could have really done things to me if they wanted yeah. to. I suppose they just didn't want to make noise. Yeah. The fundamental thing was that I thought that it was the war was senseless. It was destructive to us and to the Vietnamese. I thought that it was being um, carried on by people who didn't have any heart in it. They had they had uh, testosterone and, and maybe career ambition or something. And it came across a lot of people and a lot of operations that kind of smacked of somebody grandstanding and trying to make a splash and that kind of thing, which goes on in war a lot. Sure. But what you didn't catch is the kind of uh, esprit, I think, would be natural in World War II, mm -hmm. in uh, you know, in Europe, for example, or in the Pacific. You know, when you're fighting not only for your life, but you're fighting a definite evil, that's that's really a horrible thing. And it's life or death. The Vietnam thing was kind of a, it, it almost struck you as what people did to get advanced in the military. Mm. Not not everywhere. I know the poor the poor schmucks on, on the ground, you know, those brave people who died there. I a friend who died on the swift boat, fellow officer, and he just I went to the Vietnam Memorial and found his name with, with panel in my life. And I just bawled. Mm. I mean it was just it affects you that way. It's just but why? Why was all this happening in the first place? Suppose um but now, Ben, you see, by the time you're off the coast of South Vietnam, are you now a um, Lieutenant JG? Uh, yeah, yeah. J JG, because we spent a lot of time in shipyards before going out there. And uh, I be, on my second ship, I, I made Lieutenant. Lieutenant. So let's say that you're on watch, it's quiet, no one else is around. And, you know, some guy from... Alabama or North Dakota or Maine, some E3, you know, simple guy, just asks you, sir, why are we here? What's the, what is this all about? 1966. What do you think you might have said at that? And maybe, you know, maybe you had these conversations with junior enlisted. You said that then among the officers in the stateroom, but of course, now if you're conversing with the junior enlisted guy, it's a different thing. Um, yeah, in the wardroom, uh, in the wardroom, I think we would talk, but not not very loud and not in big groups. You knew who your friends were, who you know had had doubts about this thing, and so you would talk. Mostly, would be at the Oak Club, the shore, and having a few drinks. Mm -hmm. But when but the enlisted, we were leaders, and we knew what our responsibility was. And no, you would never. You would never talk that way with an enlisted man. Say, well, you know, there's a lot of things going on politically. I'm not sure I understand it either, but you know, we're here to follow orders, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, and uh, that's about as far as those conversations would go. If every time you'd look at your gunnery chief, and he'd roll his eyes, and you'd roll your eyes at some orders that came down, things like that. But that's normal. Yeah, sure. You mentioned the, the fishermen, you know, and. The memory you described um, didn't happen all the time, but it happened sometimes where the fishermen are angry about what's happened with their nets. Um, the Vietnamese people in their sampans or their junks that, that um, 
have to be stopped and searched. Do you have any particular memories of, you know, specific interactions with Vietnamese that that stay, stick in your mind? The closest ones that I come to, I've mentioned before, which were the uh, the uh, people from the Vietnamese military uh, who were working with our swift boat people. And uh, we would service the swift boats so that those people would come on board and they'd bring, you know, some of their famous dishes that you could barely get close to because they were been dead for years. But uh, they were all extremely friendly and respectful and that sort of thing. Yeah. But of course they were, you know, they were in the military and they were on the side of the South Vietnamese and all that sort of thing. But we never, I never got any impression that they didn't believe that it was a relationship that they should honor and that sort of thing. And even with the fishermen, most of them just looked down and didn't do anything. They, they knew, they knew where they were and what was happening. Just some of them, maybe the ones that had just washed the net and some or the fish were scared away or whatever it may be. It yeah. wasn't a common thing, but if you're sensitive enough to understand the situation, you take a simple thing like that and you blow it up and say, oh, you know, I'm making it infringe. Time in Vietnam compared to the total time in the Navy doing other things, uh, it, it wasn't this big overwhelming thing you know, just weighing it. It's not like cruising through Europe trying to reach Russia or something. Right. It was a, a very different deal. And so there were many things that we did that were good, productive, helpful, demanding. I flew a helicopter, a uh, remote controlled helicopter the size of a pickup truck, gas turbine that would deliver torpedoes off the ship, the deck of a destroyer. And uh, I spent eight weeks on Catalina Island learning how to fly this sucker. Wow. We were doing it in a destroyer, and you know, they roll this thing out for the exercises, ship rolling like this, and at these two counter rotating propellers are going at a huge speed with a scream, and you're taking this thing off, and off it goes, delivers torpedoes, comes back, and then the ship's doing this, and you gotta land that thing on the ship, closing the propellers and killing yourself. You know, those kinds of things are real challenges. They're a lot of fun. They're, they're scary as hell. But, you know, those are good experiences. Yeah. yeah. You got to, how to, how to uh, run a ship during an unrep when you're refueling, how to navigate, all those kinds of things. Coming yeah. off. Yeah. Pulling right up. All those things. Yeah. But that was a lot of, uh, that was a lot of good stuff. Yeah. A lot of great experiences. To what extent do you identify with, with other vets, you know, when you, if you're out and about and you see them with their hats, you know, the Vietnam veteran hat and that sort of thing, or you see the, the, the sticker on their car, you know, case on or something like that. To what, to what extent do you identify um, with other Vietnam vets? Oh, I think uh, very much so. And uh, I respect, I respect anybody who did that, went through it. And I don't care what their motivations were. That was something they really didn't have to do. You can find a way out of it. And uh, I was at the VA hospital some months ago. Nothing important, but I was sitting in a waiting room. And these two two elderly vets with their hats and all that stuff were sitting next to me. And we just started up a talk about it. Were you in Vietnam? Yeah. And so we're just going back and forth and, you know, Great deal of respect. Whites and blacks didn't matter. We we're talking about a, a single thing. No, I people who go and show up, even if it's for the wrong reason, it's not their reason. I'll, I'll respect that to my grave. I, I, the, that's the kind of sacrifice that you you could never want to disown. One thing that did come to mind uh, when I was just trying to put together my own thoughts from these very dusty memories was. Um, a fellow named Samuel L. Gra- Samuel um, L. Gravely, Samuel Lee Gravely Jr. Actually, who was the um, he became my commanding officer of the Tossing, the first ship I was on. Hmm. He, he had left by the time I, I sent in my resignation, and I came off the Savage, the second ship. Sam was the first black individual to. Uh, I don't know exactly where the first started to command a ship for sure, 
He was our captain, but he became a, a, a vice admiral by the time he retired. Wow. Uh, and the tosser was, was his um, first command. And he was the first uh, black to command a, a warship. Wow. And I remember when he when he came on board, the whispering going on among the crew. I mean, the blacks we had were down in the in the deckhands and things like that, gunners mates. And you know, it was it was a real chore for us as officers to you know to manage that in some way so it didn't become a real problem. But you know, that was hard to accept him. And he he turned out to be one of the inspirations of my life. 